Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'm happy to begin my lecture series on the selected gross pathology of the respiratory system. As I do with all of the systems, we're going to break these lectures down into 11 basic categories of insult to the respiratory system. And then I want to organize them by the segments of the respiratory system that the particular diseases affect. Many infectious agents have uh, evolved to attack certain parts of the respiratory system, whether it's the upper respiratory tract, which would include the nasal cavities, the larynx, and the trachea, or the lower respiratory tract, which would include the bronchi and the lungs. So that's a good way to attack that. And then, as we usually do, we're going to start with the developmental problems and get those out of the way first. As I do with all of my lectures, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who have provided images to me over the years. This particular list is going to get longer as we go through the lectures, but you can see that a number of these images will be available to you just as they are to me through Noah's Archive or the Joint Pathology Center's Wednesday Slide Conference. So with that, let's begin with a species that has tremendous amounts of congenital defects, and that is an alpaca or a llama, either of the South American camelids. Korea seem to have more congenital defects than just about any other species, and one that commonly affects the respiratory system is one that is known as coanal atresia. On this cross section of the skull, you probably notice very quickly that the turbinate bones are very poorly formed, but most importantly, notice this fibrocartilaginous membrane that crosses the nasal cavity and essentially cuts it off from the pharynx, which means that no air is going to pass that comes in through the nostrils. The coina are also known as the internal nostrils. So these animals are born as open mouth breathers. They have trouble nursing. Of course, they're prone to hypoxia on any type of activity and aspiration pneumonia. This condition is rarely seen in foals as well with no breed or sex predilection, although most of the reported cases are standard breds. Uh, these standard bred foals are diagnosed at birth if the condition is bilateral. And it's not always bilateral. You can have uh, unilateral coanal atresia, then those animals will probably be picked up as soon as they're put into training. This particular defect is sadly also seen in human babies as well. Our next collection of congenital defects is well known by anyone that owns an English Bulldog or a French Bulldog or any of the severely brachiocephalic breeds. And it's known as the brachiocephalic airway obstruction syndrome. Some people just call it brachycephalic syndrome. And this is a, uh, a constellation of four different signs that are probably best seen in English Bulldogs. I actually have a friend I graduated uh, from the University of Georgia whose mascot is a Bulldog. And everyone down in Athens, Georgia has these Bulldogs. And my friend for his career has worked on nothing but Bulldogs, doing surgery to allow these animals to breathe and not to die every time there's a hot day. So he's done very well with it, much better than the Bulldogs have. So the four components of the brachycephalic syndrome include stenotic, or very narrowed uh, nostrils, which can be surgically fixed and opened up. Uh, an elongated soft palate, which also will have to be clipped. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the relationship between the palate, the epiglottis, and the opening to the trachea in just a minute. And the most uh, common is the, or at least the most recognizable is tracheal hypoplasia. Now, a lot of people have pictures of something like this. This one's a little bit of a cheat. There are actually two different conditions that you see with trachea. One is tracheal collapse, which can be seen in a number of toy breeds, especially little overweight ones like 
uh, Yorkshire Terriers. Um, and then you have true tracheal hypoplasia. Uh, doesn't make as good a Grotz picture. There aren't as many of those floating around. And uh, that is what is part of the brachycephalic syndrome. This uh, tracheal hypoplasia can be start at the larynx, and the larynx actually sort of shrinks down, and the, the cartilage are, are sort of fused into each other. And that's why a lot of these dogs have these sort of weird croaking barks. And then the tracheal lumen is actually narrowed to the part where you don't have much or any of a dorsal tracheal ligament. Now, if we look at this one, you can see that the, uh, uh, the tracheal rings are actually, instead of being uh, sort of semicircular, they are uh, in the form of a C. They're sort of spread out, and the dorsal tracheal ligament is hanging down in that. And this is a, a process that progresses over a number of years in these uh, small breeds, or these toy breeds that have a honking cough. They have a chronic cough. They have exercise intolerance. Um, but So there is a difference between this tracheal collapse and the true tracheal hypoplasia that you see in the brachycephalic syndrome. And that's an important, uh, uh, an important difference. And I used to throw the terms around interchangeably. Uh, thank you, Taryn Donovan uh, from the Animal Medical Center who brought that to my attention. And I've been working on that for a number of years to make sure I don't use the terms incorrectly. So this one actually is tracheal collapse it's probably from a toy breed. I doubt it's from a bulldog, but most of the pictures that you see have this because it's much more photogenic. And then when you radiograph these animals on inspiration, you will see that the, the trachea here is dorsoventrally collapsed and it gets worse when these animals try to, uh, they try to inhale because it's like compressing a straw and, uh, and taking a suck on one end of it and the, you generate a lot more pressure and it tends to collapse it even more. And this is why this is a progressive uh, problem of tracheal collapse over time is the pressure and it stretches that ligament and eventually just lays down on the bottom. Makes it very difficult for these animals to breathe. Okay, hopefully we've covered that and you won't make the mistake that I made for so many years by throwing those two uh, terms around interchangeably. And then the fourth problem that we see, this is a great picture from Dr. Raquel Retch, who worked at the University of Georgia for a number of years. So I'm gonna bet you that this was an English Bulldogs, uh, English Bulldog. And we're looking at the larynx and these are the laryngeal saccules. And normally what you will see are just two little slits here. Okay, and there is a membrane that sort of hangs down underneath them. And we talked about how much inspiratory pressure these animals have to do to just to breathe. Um, and so what happens is over time, because of those high pressures, they pop these out into the lumen, which further hampers their breathing. This is everted laryngeal saccules. Okay, it's no wonder that English Bulldogs have uh, such respiratory problems. They often die suddenly, especially on hot days. Um, a normal dolicocephalic dog has a long nose, and the inside of that nasal cavity is how it dissipates heat. Remember, we don't, dogs don't sweat. Well, when you cram that face in, you maybe give these animals 10% of that total surface area, which they use to dissipate heat. And then we throw all of these uh, other congenital abnormalities to further hamper the passage of air. And uh, it is not uncommon for English Bulldogs to just expire on a hot day. Now we looked at the dorsal ventral flattening of the, uh, uh, of Bulldogs, well, horses will get that as well. Now, theirs are, are very often, or just as often, side-to-side -side flattening. And this is known in horses as the scabbard trachea. So they have a form of tracheal hypoplasia as well. This is most commonly seen in ponies and American miniature horses 
uh, obviously, this can go a long time. They could have this for quite a while because neither of those breeds are, are considered tremendous athletes. So, you know, for one of these animals who's just walking around as a pasture pet may not be a problem. Obviously, this is going to be an issue for any type of athletic horse. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ryan Traslafina, for this fantastic picture. Okay. Here's a great picture by Dr. John King, and it illustrates uh, one problem that we see in horses. Uh, it's not a common problem, and the condition is the result of epiglottal hypoplasia, or a smaller epiglottis than normal. Now here's a really nice picture that I just pulled off the internet uh, from the uh, British Medical Journal, and you can see this is what the proper anatomy and size of the epiglottis should be. Here's the epiglottis. You have these sort of serrated wings on the side. Uh, here are the aerial epiglottic folds, and here is the essentially the entrance to the trachea, the larynx and the entrance to the trachea here. And if we saw the soft palate, it would start here and it would come underneath and sit underneath the epiglottis. When you swallow, okay, you are moving food from the pharynx backwards. You do not want to get it in here. So it's a very natural um, process in which when swallowing is initiated, the epiglottis flips back up and it covers the entrance to the trachea and then the food will slide down into the esophagus underneath the closed epiglottis. And that's how it works in the vast majority of cases. Well, in horses, one of the problems that you will see is some horses have a hypoplastic epiglottis. And it causes a number of problems. It slips back, because it's small, slips back behind the areoepiglottic folds into the entrance of the trachea. Just by this position, it causes stertor and, and respiratory problems. But what is even worse is it can't flip back up and completely close the, uh, uh, the tracheal lumen, so to speak, or at least the laryngeal lumen. And so what is going to happen is it will partially close it. The soft palate will flip up on top of it and partially close it. But there is always a chance for inhalation, especially if the animal's exercising, inhalation of uh, respiratory or, or oral secretions or saliva or aspiration pneumonia. Um, this also can be a contributory condition to a, uh, a second condition um, called dorsal displacement of the soft palate. Remember, the soft palate normally lives underneath the lip of the epiglottis. And when it's so short, it'll just lay on top. And this, as you can imagine, will cause uh, more respiratory difficulties, stertor, and diminish performance. Those are two conditions that are often seen together. Um, just one thing, and we'll see more of this as we go further back, but horses often have a lot of lymphoid tissue in the area of the larynx and the pharynx, and it's uh, not generally considered a pathologic finding. Uh, some people say, well, it's associated with previous viral infections or whatever, but, but it seems to be increased when there's a lot of stertor here. And we'll see this in a lot of laryn larynxes of horses. Those are funny words. Okay, so we have epiglottal hypoplasia and dorsal displacement of the soft palate. I understand it. It's difficult to uh, figure out what happens when you swallow. So always worth a minute or two to go back, Google it, and make sure you understand that process, and then you'll understand the diseases that go along with it. Well, here is a funky looking bit of tissue. And if we had the heart, the heart would be very large in this picture. And these are what hypoplastic lungs look like. Okay, so pulmonary hypoplasia. There's a number of things 
that have to happen for proper development of the lungs. And when you get pulmonary hypoplasia that looks like this in this picture from a calf, normally the airway system is pretty well developed, but it's the alveoli that don't develop. Now to start with, there are a number of causes, and most of the causes refer to the inability for the lungs to grow. So it may be associated with uh, hydrops fetalis, especially hydramnios, where there's so much uh, fluid uh, in the amnion, the animal cannot expand its chest. Remember that, that uh, fetuses tend to expand their chest. They swallow, it's full of fluid, but, but they have to have these motions for those lungs to grow properly. Now, the, uh, when the animal's born, the airway is pretty much finished growing. Well, it'll continue to grow, obviously, but, but uh, it is mature at that point. But the alveoli are not. If you ever look at a, uh, uh, autopsy section of, of a very young animal, you're going to look at those lungs and say, there are just way too many cells. Get a lot of nuclei because the alveoli will continue to mature over time. And it's thought that it will probably not attain the adult configuration until uh, somewhere around five weeks after birth. You know, I gotta keep remembering to look at the camera. Uh, this is the first time I've used a, uh, a camera. So you get to see me and hand motions and all that. So uh, if I don't look at a camera, I apologize. Okay, so um, during development, there are compounds which are very important for proper development of the lung. The pneumocytes secrete a number of different chemicals. Some people used to call this lung milk or lung liquid, but they are required for proper development. Something else that will be required for proper development is surfactant. So the animal, when the animal takes its first breath, um, those alveolar membranes will not stick together. And we'll talk about surfactant in just a minute. So we talked about uh, anything that keeps the lungs from expanding may result in pulmonary hypoplasia. It may be diffuse, as you see here. It may be just one part of the lobule. We did mention uh, hydrops fetalis. Uh, in Dexter Bulldog calves, there's tremendous anasarca. That may do it. Um, congenital diaphragmatic hernias or intrathoracic masses or anything that prevents the normal in and out motion of the chest can lead to pulmonary hypoplasia. Okay, this is a great picture um, from Noah's Archive. It's available to you if you want to go on to Noah's Archive and get it. And what we're looking at, once again, are full lungs and they're collapsed. Now, this could be, and most commonly is from a stillborn fetus. If you've ever had to do uh, insurance claims on fetuses, the number one and overriding question is, did the animal take a breath? Okay, if the animal never took a breath, generally the insurance company will have to pay off on the value of the animal and the breeding. If the animal took a breath, which meant it got up or at least it, it looked around and took the breath and the, the lung is inflated, then oftentimes the insurance companies don't pay off. So it's, there's a lot of money riding on the question very often in uh, perigestational deaths, whether the animal took a breath or didn't take a breath. Take a breath. It can be very difficult um, to look at something under the microscope and say this animal took a breath or it didn't take a breath. And I think we're all familiar with the fact that if an animal is not posted very quickly, lungs will collapse. The ear will come out and the lung will look atelectatic and it's very difficult to make that determination under the microscope. On the other side, if you take a uh, formalin and you run it into the airway, which I think is a great idea for routine autopsies, you can artificially inflate those alveoli. And uh, just for uh, 
people who are out there doing autopsies, especially small animals, a little bit of formalin in the lungs will make your job a lot easier. For mice and rats, I will uh, just put a, a 30 or 60 cc syringe into the trachea, gently flush the lungs, you'll see them inflate, and then I put them in the formalin bucket and I make my incisions there. Okay, so, but that has nothing to do with this. So we're talking about atelectasis and, and it's not a difficult uh, decision to make. If you have this, the first thing that you want to do is you want to take a section of lung and you want to put it in your formalin container. If it floats, the animal took a breath. If it sinks, the animal didn't take a breath. There's no air to make it float and it will sink to the bottom of the formalin. So that's often a very important test, especially insurance cases, and a lot is going to be riding on that. One other condition that I want to uh, uh, mention just very briefly uh, is one that, once again, affects uh, uh, foals, and it's known as respiratory distress syndrome. It is a problem that is also seen in human children. Uh, it's been identified in dogs and some non-human primates, and it has to do with a congenital deficiency in the production of surfactant proteins. Okay, surfactant, as we know, is created by type 2 pneumocytes um, and is part of the mechanism which coats the lining of the alveoli so when the animal takes its first breath or any breath, okay, normal surface tension is going to keep those alveoli like that, okay, but what this, the lipoproteins associated with surfactant, surfactant itself doesn't do it. But there are a number of surfactant proteins. There are four that are secreted. Three really are not all that important, but surfactant protein B is a lipoprotein that's involved in spreading all these proteins over the surface along with surfactant. So it's more than just surfactant. Um, surfactant lipoproteins, um, they help spread this material over the uh, inside of the alveoli. And that way, when uh, air comes in, it doesn't collapse and stay like that. Um, unfortunately, uh, these foals, they don't, uh, they don't produce this. Um, they have a expiratory grunt or a bark um, from birth. They rapidly become hypoxemic, um, develop heart failure. Uh, in humans, and I don't think it's been identified yet in horses, but in humans, um, it is well known as a sign of uh, dismaturity um, and is often seen in premature infants. Um, approximately 30% of infants uh, born before 30 weeks of gestation, remember it's about 36, 37 in humans, and about 30% of infants less than 30 weeks of age um, and 60% of human infants uh, born before 28 weeks have this particular condition. Um, we're blessed now that there are, uh, um, we know about the condition, there are proteins that can be used in place of surfactant proteins, not as good, but to help these uh, preemie babies get to a point where they can generate their own live and breathe. You know, this really isn't a congenital defect. Um, it's not a, not really a pathology, but it's something that you are going to see uh, a lot in, especially our production animals. You see a lot in sheep and goats, especially. Um, not that unusual in pigs. And this is simply the accumulation of pigmented cells. Um, and this is a condition those, known as melanosis. It really is a nothing lesion. Um, yeah, it makes a nice picture, but that's about it. These, these aggregates of pigment-laden cells are flat, and they just don't do much of anything. And so here's some in the liver, and here's some in the lungs. This is uh, uh, in a pig. We have melanosis again. This is a a uh, interesting condition 
this is probably natural, but there is a, a breed of pig called the Siciliana or the Nero pig, which has an acquired form of melanosis from eating acorns. And there's some oxidizable protein in the acorn and it accumulates in the body and it forms a very, uh, protein is very close to melanin. So uh, the Nero Siciliano pig. And then just to compare this, um, this particular picture, I just wanted to, this is from a dog and this is a melanoma. And so you shouldn't have too much trouble identifying a melanoma in which the, uh, these are raised from the surface. Um, these cells are big and plump and there are many of them. These are neoplastic melanocytes. Um, and these are just a few melanocytes and a lot of other cells that have picked up the pigment, usually epithelial cells. So melanosis, melanoma. Okay, well that brings us to the end of the developmental diseases of the nasal tract, like all of the lectures. This, this is selected gross pathology. This is not intended to be a encyclopedic review of all the uh, potential congenital developmental abnormalities of the, the nasal tract, but certainly are the ones I think are important and the ones that I think I have pretty good uh, images of to show you. So uh, our next lecture will be part one of a two-part series on viral diseases of the respiratory tract. So I hope that you'll come back tomorrow to the Foundation's Facebook page, to the Foundation's YouTube channel, or the JPC's uh, video library, wherever you see these videos. And I look forward to talking to you tomorrow.